is the wrong place we should be looking in the budget for drastic cutbacks. I've been one of the leaders in this place for significant farm bill reform to, to get at the outdated uh, agriculture subsidies. I'd ask unanimous consent for one additional minute. Is there objection? Gentleman may proceed for one minute. Thank you. you know, for years I've been leading the effort for farm bill reform to end these taxpayer subsidies going to a few but large agribusinesses that distort the market, distort trade policy. It's not helping our family farmers. Finally, a discussion is starting to take place seriously to actually scrub those programs. And yet when I've led this cause in the past, I remember not too long ago, a member in this body accused me of being the Osama bin Laden of agriculture policy. And yet today, if we had taken those actions 10 years ago, when many of us were acting on it, maybe we wouldn't be finding ourselves in this huge fiscal hole uh, that we have today. So not only the policy writers, but the spending cuts that are being proposed is the wrong direction for our nation to go. It will jeopardize these vital programs, <coughs> programs again that have enjoyed wide bipartisan support, and we ought not be balancing the budget on their backs. Over the last 30 years, funding for conservation programs have gone from 1.7% of federal funding to less than 0.6%. They've given at the altar of fiscal responsibility. We can't go any deeper. And I encourage members to, to support the Dix Amendment, oppose the underlying bill. We have to do a better job. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Mexico rock? Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I reluctantly rise to oppose the gentleman from Washington's amendment and support the underlying bill. A lot of compelling arguments have been made tonight to support the Endangered Species Act without interruption. They talk about the bald eagle and the compelling story about seeing those magnificent birds. And those are visual images that we all like. But there's a side to the Endangered Species Act that is not being told. That's the side where one group just this year filed 1,000 petitions at one time to list new species. They know that their lawyers get reimbursed from the federal government every time they bring suit. And so they're happy to bring these actions which are destroying jobs in the West. For instance, in the 2nd District of New Mexico, a, listing, a suggested listing was uh, given this year on the sand dune lizard, a small brown lizard that I've seen in the sand hills since I was growing up there. They were plentiful then. They're about the same number now. But they've been listed as endangered. And people didn't think much of it. And then they began to read the reports that anything that disturbed the surface of the ground would represent a potential threat to the habitat of the lizard and would thereby be prohibited. Disturb the ground, they ask. What does that mean? Well, that means oil and gas activity. That means that $2.8 billion investment for nuclear enrichment that is taking place in southern Lee County just taking place now, creating jobs for the first time in a nuclear industry that has been dormant for 30 years, would be shut down because they disturbed the ground. It would stop the high line wires from being uh, put up, from the electric utility crews from driving to the homesteads miles and miles away from the nearest town because they would disturb the ground. They could not even check the power lines to make sure electricity is going to these remote areas. This is the Endangered Species Act that we're seeing. And people would come to me in disbelief and say, Mr. Pierce, it is not true. They couldn't kill our jobs with a lizard, could they? What about us as humans? What do they say? I said, take a look at the San Joaquin Valley. 27,000 farmers put out of work with a two-inch delta smelt that we could have kept alive in holding ponds and bred by the millions and put into the rivers and go ahead and use the rivers for irrigation, but instead a judge found that we had to shut down the entire agriculture product. We began to import vegetables from areas that spray contaminations that we are not allowed to use in this nation, a less safe food supply. We killed 27,000 jobs. We caused jobs to be created somewhere else, less safe food supply all for a two-inch minnow that could have been kept alive in some other fashion. We also have a lesser prairie chicken that threatens the oil and gas jobs in our area. They're saying that the burden might not fly under or over those lines, so we can't put up 
electric lines across. Well, then bury the lines, people say. Well, then the lizard wouldn't go across the area that's been disturbed by burying the lines. It's easy to see why people are saying that the Endangered Species Act is not functioning properly, and we've got to stop it. We're spending $3.5 trillion a year in our government, and we're bringing in 2.2. Part of the problem is we've killed enough of our jobs, we've killed enough of our economy that we're in severe debt and deficit crisis. Now, one of the problems is we've systematically eliminated the timber industry because of a spotted owl. We eliminated those 27,000 farmer jobs in the San Joaquin Valley. We've got the salmon that's swimming upstream, and now it's threatening that uh, we've got to tear down all of the hydroelectric dams. And the list goes on and on. It is time for us to say that we can preserve the species and create jobs at the same time. That's not an unreasonable request. But to those lawyers making $350 an hour, they don't care if it's reasonable or not. To the Fish and Wildlife Service, they arrogantly told the people in New Mexico, no, we didn't do an economic study to see the cost on the jobs. We're not required to. These are things that are making people say enough is enough. It's in my district that 900 people showed up to protest at one of the hearings on the listing of the lizard. 900 people coming out so that the Fish and Wildlife Service came to me in nervousness uh, before the meeting and said, would you speak to those who couldn't get into the meeting? They're uh, agitated. I said, people do get agitated when you start killing their careers, when you start taking the jobs away from them. Jones, There's a side fired. to the Endangered Species Act that is being dealt with here tonight. I support Jones. the underlying bill and oppose Gentlemen. the amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purposes does the gentlelady from California rise? I rise to strike the last word. Ladies are recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word to speak in favor of Mr. Dick's amendment to remove this destructive and short sighted anti wildlife rider from the underlying bill. The rider would gut the Endangered Species Act as we've been discussing, a law that has worked for 40 years to successfully conserve our nation's plants and animals. It would do this by blocking the Fish and Wildlife Service from new listings and bar the designation of critical habitat for currently listed species. As has been said on both sides of the aisle this evening, this provision creates a one-way path to weakening wildlife protections by allowing the service to delist and downgrade a species status from endangered to threatened, but not to list new species. Unless a species is listed, it receives no protection under the ESA. Currently, the service has identified over 260 species that warrant protection but cannot be listed due to a lack of federal resources. That's 260 species of plants and animals found across the nation that are in dire need of assistance and are at risk of disappearing forever. Mr. Chairman, America's native plants and animals are already in serious trouble. Under constant threat from toxic pesticides, air and water pollution, habitat destruction, and climate change. But this short-sighted and irresponsible rider may prove to be the most immediate and serious threat of all. Sending countless species into dis extinction, destroying America's great conservation legacy. It's our responsibility here to protect and conserve our nation's most precious resources for future generations. And of course, that's why the Endangered Species Act was written. It codifies our commitment to good stewardship and preserves what we hold dear for the benefit of our children and our grandchildren. Since its initiation, we've witnessed incredible comebacks. Animals that were once at the verge of disappearing are forever, forever, are thriving once again. Because of the Endangered Species Act and other successful partnerships, bald eagles have returned not only to Washington State, but to the Channel Islands off the coast of my congressional district. Just a few years ago, a pair of nesting bald eagles produced the first wild-born chicks on Santa Cruz Island in 50 years. Also on the Central Coast, we've seen California condors and peregrine falcons soaring through our skies once again. The Guadalupe fur seal, which was hunted to near extinction, can now be seen swimming off the Channel Islands. There are similar success stories for the southern sea otter and the blue whale, both found in central coast waters of California, and the return of island foxes, whose population dropped down to less than 100, but now is back above 1,200. Mr. Chairman, of course there are so many examples across the country, Florida panthers, gray wolves, grizzly bears, and hundreds more species that have not gone extinct 
after receiving protection under the Act. These species can't wait any longer, and we can't let them disappear forever on our watch. I strongly urge my colleagues to support Mr. Dick's amendment to strike this irresponsible provision in the bill. We can and must do better. Our children and our grandchildren are depending upon us. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Utah rise? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I rise to support Mr. Dick's idea, but not the process that he is using to get there. It is one of the amazing things as you look about the debate on this particular amendment. It's like ships passing in the night, getting close but never actually touching. Because everyone who has spoken so far has saying the same thing. We want to have an Endangered Species Act that works. This needs to be fixed or amended and changed in some way to make it work better, to involve in the entire process so that everyone is working towards the same goal. But for some reason, it flat out is not happening. And it's not happening because we have violated the process. Everyone has said this is not the right place to try and fix the, the Endangered Species Act. That's also true. But it's the only process that's allowed because we have violated our own intent. Appropriators are supposed to appropriate funds to programs. Authorizers are supposed to create the programs and then every so often reauthorize those programs to make changes based on the need or to make sure that we are moving in the proper direction. Let me introduce you or at least remind you of Joe Gotchner, one of my favorite baseball players at the turn of the century with the Cleveland Indians. He was, and he was good enough to play regular at shortstop for Cleveland, although the first year he played, he committed 48 errors, and his batting average was 187. Still good enough to stay around for the next year, where this time his errors were just, just slightly under 100. He had a hard time hitting the first baseman when he threw. And his batting average was once again 187. I say that specifically because the most inept player ever to put on spikes and play Major League Baseball had a batting average of 187. The Endangered Species Act has listed over 2,000 species and saved 21 for a batting average of 10 if you round up. It's actually .009. That clearly indicates we can do better and we need to do better. So the question has to simply be, why aren't we doing better? Why can't we fix this problem and have a better success rate? And the answer is very simple. For 23 years, we have put riders on this particular Appropriations Act to fully fund the old program, which has prohibited the authorizing committee to ever get people together to make the program better. Chairman Hastings has simply said his goal is to provide a process that improves the system and there is room for improvement of the system. But to do that, you've got to get the players to sit down in the authorizing committees where this is supposed to be worked out. The Endangered Species Act needs to be, needs to be expanded, needs to be fixed, needs to zero in to create, to create people working together for a common goal. I am actually grateful for Representative Dix and Representative Simpson and what they have done in this bill. This amendment in the underlying bill does not destroy the Endangered Species Act. It doesn't even cut the funding for those, those species that are already being, uh, being worked on. All it does is provide a change in the process to insist that people have to do what we should have been doing for the last 23 years, going to the authorizing committee and fixing the act and not just kicking the can down the road by funding it year after year after year after year while only 21 species have recovered over the 2,000 that could have and should have been. And I'm sorry, that's what everyone is saying. We all want species to be preserved and recovered, but we all are failing in the process and after 23 years we should have learned what we have been doing in the past doesn't work. Maybe if we went back to the way the system was intended to be and was designed to function, we could actually move forward in this entire issue, which oddly enough is what everyone is saying. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Washington. I move to what strike the gentleman rise? requisite number of words. Is there objection? Gentlemen, Just I will do this very briefly. 
as I recall, from 1995 to 2007, um, the other side, the majority party today, was the majority party then. And I don't remember any great effort on the Endangered Species Act. Now, I welcome it. I welcome you? any act can be made better. With the gentleman you? And now you guys are in charge again. And you have another opportunity, Mr. I think, believe Mr. Bishop's been on the committee for a, quite a long time. I'm going to go look for his, his, his reform bill uh, in the record to see what, what's been happening here. So I, of course I'll yield. I'll yield first to the distinguished chairman from Washington State, the Natural Resources Committee, and then to Mr. Well, Simpson. Some I said it did. I know, but he's, he's senior to you. Well, I, I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding, and I, and I appreciate the gentleman's remarks. I would remind him that from the time that we did maintain, get control of the Congress in 1995 until your, your side gained control uh, after the 2006 elections, uh, the then chairman, uh, the last chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, uh, Richard Pombo from California, that was the issue that he was working on, and as a matter of fact, I think it was in two five, 2005, we did pass ES reform out of this house. It did not go any place in the other body, so history tends to repeat itself. But here Former is the, Senator Kempthorne worked on it. He did, as, as did Senator Crapo from Idaho. But my point is, is that, yes, we, we, we and, and here's the problem. The problem is, is that when, through all the efforts of Chairman Pombo of trying to get this enacted, and he couldn't get it through the Senate, then what did the, the Appropriation Committee did? He kicked okay. the can ahead, and there was no incentive for now, the stakeholders. Now, regaining my time, regaining my time, because I don't, uh, I can't we, go we on can forever. We can ask consent I, I, just, I just would say, nobody's stopping you. Hold your hearings. Have your meetings. With the Bring up you. the witnesses. But don't stop listing 260 candidate species until you get the job done. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, of course I'll yield. Well, good, I appreciate it. Listen, I have been chairman now for a little over six months. Well, we, I, have, I, have every intent, I have every intent to do that, and I want to work with the gentleman on no. this. And I want to be involved in this because I believe will. very much so. Now I yield to the, my good friend and and uh, the, I think the chairman gentleman. and former ranking member, one of the best ranking members I ever had, <laughs> Mr. Simpson. I thank, I thank the gentleman for yielding. And Mr. Bishop had it exactly right. We all want the same thing here. We want the Endangered Species Act, but we want the Endangered Species Act to work. And as you mentioned, Senator Kempthorne worked on it very hard, got it through the Senate, and frankly, it was some... When he was at Interior. When he was, no, when he was uh, a senator before he became governor of Idaho. Uh, and it was some Republicans, frankly, in the House that stopped it because they didn't think it went far enough. Unfortunately, if we just continue to do what we've done in the past, we're going to get exactly what we've got in the past, and that is no incentive for people to sit down and say, we've got to work on this and we've got to get it done, and that's all we're trying to do. That's all, right, all we're trying to do. I, 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 encourage, yield. I, I yield to the, to the ranking member. I do think it might be instructive that Mr. Pombo is no longer among our ranks, and the principal reason <laughs> is the Endangered Species Act authorization that he attempted to write, which was so destructive of the intent, the original intent of the Endangered Species Act back in 1965, and it was a Republican Senate that defeated it, that would not let it pass. I, I, happy to yell. I, 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 Washington State. I just want to respond to my friend from Virginia. The bill passes, if my memory serves me correct, with bipartisan support. But yes, of course there are political risks in doing whatever we're doing uh, in this body. I and mean, we, all, we all face that. After all, this is a people's government. But the point is, it need, and we've been saying over and over, the ESA needs to be updated. It's been 23 years, for goodness sakes. Well, no That's one's objecting. We, we, I agree. We, we should look at how to improve the a ESA. I don't like to hear these examples of, of uh, where this is, the process has not been, been able to be worked out. I've had to go through this, as you have, in the Pacific Northwest with the spotted owl, the marbled murelet, salmon, etc. Now, th those are starting to recover. We're making some progress. But I, I still believe we can make this act better. I just think by taking out... Uh, the, the, the ability to list yes, and to have critical you know, habitat, we're yes, risking sir. some of these species that are close to extinction. And remember this, it's also about biodiversity. 
the web of life. We, we, ha we don't know how all these things relate and whether something could be created, a medicine that could save lives in the future. And that's why trying to protect these ex ex species is an important... Expired. Ask unanimous consent the gentleman have one more minute. Is there objection? And, I, and, and this right is important for civilization, for humanity. You know, we're, we're, we're creatures here too. We depend on a lot of other animals in order to survive. And so th this is, uh, this goes beyond with the gentleman just, this, this goes beyond just a legislative, it's difficult. This is down and dirty. This is very important to survival. Yes, with the I gentleman, you don't disagree with anything the gentleman just said. It's also important to remember that this amendment would take the caps off that have been in place since President Clinton and would undermine the Fish and Wildlife Service's budget to a great degree because it would then be controlled by the courts and by lawsuits. That's not where we want to go. We'll fix it in conference. <laughs> I yield back. The gentleman yields back. <laughs> Question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Washington. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. A, re a recorded vote has been requested. <laughs> Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Washington will be postponed. Gen the clerk will read. Page 9, line 13, construction, $11,804,000. Land acquisition, fifteen million forty-seven thousand dollars. Cooperative da Endangered Species Conservation Fund, two million eight hundred and fifty-four thousand dollars. National Wildlife Refuge Fund, thirteen million nine hundred and eighty thousand dollars. North American Wetlands Conservation Fund, twenty million dollars. I have an amendment. Does the gentleman from Arkansas rise? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Griffin of Arkansas. Page 10, line 21. Insert after the dollar amount the following, increased by $3 million. Page 65, line 19. Insert after the dollar amount the following, reduced by $3 million. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise to offer an amendment which will leverage our limited resources for wetlands and wildlife conservation. My amendment would transfer $3 million to the North American Wetlands Conservation Fund, or NACU, by reducing the EPA's operations and administration budget by the same amount. The EPA has been overfunded in recent years, and I appreciate Subcommittee Chairman Simpson's efforts to bring the agency's budget back down to size. This amendment makes a reasonable reduction to the EPA's administrative budget in favor of wetland conservation. Since this organization was established in 1989, more than 1,800 projects have led to the conservation of over 24 million acres of wetlands across North America. Each of these projects is funded through a public-private partnership, and for every dollar of, of <clears throat> the organization's money that is spent in my home state of Arkansas, private sources and foundations have given $4 in matching funds. In Arkansas alone, 12 of these projects are either completed or currently underway. And these projects have conserved over 64,000 acres of wetlands. Make no mistake, this success story is not limited to Arkansas. Wetlands, wildlife, and outdoorsmen in every single state in the country have seen the benefits of this conservation effort. Arkansas sits in the cradle of the Mississippi Flyway, a migration route used by waterfowl as they fly to the southern United States each autumn. Migratory waterfowl and other birds often settle in the wetlands along the White River and Arkansas River, and the health of these habitats is closely tied to the health of the wildlife which inhabit them. This amendment would improve the condition of our nation's wetlands and wildlife. This is important to sportsmen, conservationists, and anyone who enjoys the American outdoors. I urge my colleagues to support this common-sense conservation amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, claim the time in opposition, and I can. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, have the voting record from February 16th. Uh, I, I know the gentleman will recall HR1 
and the debate that ensued in H.R. 1, uh, the North American Wetlands Conservation Fund was zeroed out. And so uh, I had an amendment to restore $50 million to the North American Wetlands Conservation Program. What I find uh, curious, confusing, is that the very gentleman that now wants to put money into the program voted no against putting the $50 million into the North American Wetlands Conservation Program back in the spring. Now, I do think it's an important program. I would like to see it continued. But I do have a problem with the fact that uh, what we're doing when we want something to be uh, funded, we take it out of the management of agencies. Three million, five million, six million. And when these amendments pass, you have a very damaging cumulative effect upon the ability of the, pro of the agency to manage these programs. If this were to pass, we're now at $8 million that has been taken out of the management of EPA. So I would, um, I would have to pose the amendment, and I, I'm not sure that how strongly the gentleman feels about it since he voted uh, against restoring the money in February, as did a great many uh, members of the body, unfortunately, because it is a good program. And uh, I'll reserve the uh, balance of my time. I can't reserve Gen anyway, so Gen I'll the yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to accept the amendment. Uh, while the gentleman from Virginia offered an amendment on H.R. 1, which was several months ago, uh, it was $50 million. We didn't have that kind of money. Because of the bipartisan support for this program, we did fund it to keep it alive at $20 million. And I have no problem putting the additional funding in that the gentleman requests and where he takes it from. So I support the gentleman's amendment and would hope that, uh, that my friend from Virginia would think twice and support this amendment. <laughs> I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arkansas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The clerk will read. Page 10, line 23, Multinational Species Conservation Fund, $7,875,000. State and Tribal Wildlife Grants, $22 million. Administrative Provisions. Appropriations shall be available for repair of damage to public roads within reservation areas. National Park Service, operation of the National Park System, $2,240,152,000. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I have an amendment uh, at the desk, number 049. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Tonko of New York. Page 14, line 7, after the first dollar amount, insert, de insert decreased by $8,408,000. Page 14, line 19, after the dollar amount, insert increased by $8,408,000. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I rise today to offer an amendment to H.R. 2584, the Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies Appropriations Act for fiscal year 12. The amendment is bipartisan and is supported by the Congressional National Heritage Caucus and the 49 National Heritage Areas across our country. The amendment is straightforward and modest. The amendment restores the National Heritage Area program within the National Park Service to the fiscal year 10 funding levels. This amount is constant with the amount approved by Congress for the past several years. To pay for this increase, the amendment shifts $8 million $408,000 away from the Office of National Park Systems account. From Alaska to Florida, the National Heritage Areas are the most effective public-private partnerships for resource conservation and heritage tourism supported by the federal government. While each of the 49 National Heritage Areas currently in existence are authorized to receive $1 million in annual support through the Department of Interior, 
the national heritage area program has only been funded between fifteen and eighteen million dollars over the past five years by congress despite their success in revitalizing communities and conserving nationally significant resources with only modest federal support these public private partnerships are perhaps the most cost effective and efficient programs within the department of interior matching every dollar of federal support with five dollars and fifty cents of other public and private funding national heritage areas are clearly a, a high yield investment of federal resources to be clear that investment results in over one hundred million dollars of economic activity during a time when our economy is so fragile we must support these programs that have a proven record of economic benefit national heritage areas have such a proven record of fostering job creation and advancing economic cultural historic environmental and community development in addition to creating jobs the national heritage areas generate valuable revenue for local governments and sustain communities through revitalization and heritage tourism more specifically in my district a recent study released last year by my local heritage area the erie canal way heritage corridor found that visitors to heritage sites in the eastern part of the corridor found that nearly one million people visit heritage sites each year generating some thirty eight million dollars in sales and local businesses supporting five hundred and seven local jobs we must preserve sites that are historically significant doing so will increase community spirit as well as generate much needed tourism dollars a recent united states cultural and heritage tourism marketing council and united states department of commerce study revealed that cultural heritage travelers contribute more than one hundred and ninety two billion dollars annually to our united states economy i would point out also that this tool this opportunity for heritage areas enables given regions to have a stronger sense of marketing uh, tools they are able to promote a stronger sense of place and a much more dynamic bit of destination that is a tool in the economic recovery toolkit that is tremendously valuable and important to these given host regions i want to thank representative dent of pennsylvania for offering this amendment with me today he is the co-chair of the national heritage area caucus in the house and he and his staff have been a pleasure to work with on this amendment i also need to thank our ranking uh, member of the committee uh, mr dix and our ranker of the subcommittee uh, representative moran they have been invaluable in their support in my effort for this amendment understanding today's difficult budgetary climate i want to remind everyone that this amount is equal to the total appropriation for the program in the previous fiscal year and reflects the minimum level of support national heritage areas need to remain successful i hope my colleagues will consider joining mr dent and myself in supporting this modest funding level for a vitally important program with that mr chair i yield back the balance of my time and thank the gentleman you gentleman yields back for purposes, does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Uh, I move to restrict the last word, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman Speaker. is recognized Chairman. for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I do rise support in support of the uh, Tonko Amendment. Uh, Mr. Tonko and I have uh, uh, offered this amendment for consideration by the House. Uh, we are the co-chairs of the Heritage uh, Corridor Caucus. Uh, I represent the areas of the Delaware-Lehigh Heritage Corridor as well as the Schuylkill Valley uh, Corridor in eastern Pennsylvania. And we have seen a great deal of positive activity as a result of these heritage areas. Uh, specifically, as uh, Mr. Tonko uh, uh, conveyed, uh, a great deal of tourism activity, recreational opportunities, uh, economic development as well occurs as a result of this. Uh, and also uh, significant community development activities uh, have been uh, the result of our efforts and investment in these heritage areas. Uh, Obviously, money is very tight, uh, and uh, this program is taking about a 50% uh, reduction uh, under the underlying bill. Uh, the amendment before us will uh, simply restore about $8.4 million uh, to the heritage area, uh, to the heritage partnership program, uh, and we'll be taking that money, uh, substituting it from the National Park Service. We believe they have sufficient funds to, uh, to operate. Uh, I do uh, support the underlying legislation. I know Chairman Simpson has put a lot of effort into this, and uh, I think he's really done a, a great deal of the, given the, the numbers he's had to work with. And so I do support the underlying bill. But I, I think that this amendment tr strikes a proper balance, uh, preserves and protects uh, these heritage areas uh, that are making a real impact uh, across the country. 
and we have many of these heritage areas uh, that, are, that are currently operating. Uh, I guess there are 49 of these heritage areas uh, currently in existence, and uh, most of them, I believe, are receiving under a million dollars of support through the Interior Department. So I just think this is a, a program that uh, is worthy of our support. Uh, we're just simply, in these tough economic times, just trying to bring this program uh, back to neutral. I know the administration uh, did not, uh, uh, in their, pre in their uh, budget proposal, uh, uh, cut this program as well. But I think this might be one way, this amendment, to help us uh, bring this program back to a level uh, that will be sufficient to supporting these heritage areas. And as stated again by Mr. Tonko, uh, that these communities are benefiting. Uh, we are seeing so much tourist activity. Uh, we're seeing increased recreational opportunities. I know in my community we are all of a sudden uh, doing things on our rivers and discovering our rivers and the natural beauty of them that we had really, many of us had not really uh, noticed before. And it's really as a result of this. And again, uh, it brought the rivers back to life, economic life, community life, uh, and have become really the, once again the center of our existence. And uh, a lot of this would not have been possible but for the efforts of these heritage areas. So again, I rise in support of the uh, Tonko uh, Dent Amendment and would urge the House uh, to adopt this, uh, this, and I would uh, yield back at this time. Gentleman yields back. Let me yield it. I'll gentleman yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purposes well, does the gentleman from Virginia rise? I'll rise to strike the last word. The gentleman Mr. Uh, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I, I want uh, us to, our side to go on record in support of wh what Mr. Tomko and Mr. Dent are proposing. We have worked with them on this amendment. Uh, the, uh, this is the kind of program that really ought to have unanimous support in the House. I mean, we're talking about very small amounts of money that are distributed throughout the country, uh, oftentimes 150,000, uh, sometimes it gets up to 700,000, but this relatively small amounts of money. And what they do is to bring local community leaders together. Local communities love it, and of course it draws tourism, uh, people, it gets into the newspaper, oftentimes into metropolitan newspapers, and uh, is suggesting this is a terrific day trip uh, for families to go on. They follow the Heritage Trail. Uh, it has that kind of national recognition and uh, uh, credibility that, uh, uh, that uh, only the federal government uh, oftentimes can provide to a National Heritage Trail because many people claim it. But when the National Heritage uh, Program identifies it as one of the true uh, uh, um, assets of our country and places that should be protected and preserved and, and uh, explained to the public, then more people come. And it generates jobs. It generates economic activity. They, Mr. Wolf uh, just put in an authorization. He probably won't get the the amount of full amount of money he, that's authorized, but he'll get some for uh, the Civil War Battlefield Crossroads Trail. Uh, and uh, that's drawing uh, people up with the sesquicentennial of the, uh, of the Civil War. Um, uh, all over the country, the Hudson River, there was a gentleman that, uh, on the other side that opposed it when Mr. Hinchy uh, put it in, had it designated, and then when he saw how successful it was, he said, hey, let's get my part of the Hudson River included. This is a really good program. It was funded at 17 point eight, uh, about $17 million. 50% cut, though. What are we doing? Talk about being penny-wise and pound-foolish, really. A 50% cut, and it, it hurts the economies uh, of... Uh, any number of areas around the country. Uh, so uh, we think that this is a very reasonable amendment, and we congratulate uh, the caucus for uh, coming forward and, and suggesting that the money be restored. So, and we hope that it will be. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Idaho rise? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. First, let me thank uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania and the gentleman from New York for their amendment. I'm sympathetic to what they're trying to do and the work that they do in the National Heritage uh, Caucus. Uh, it's important work. But I, but I rise in reluctant opposition to the amendment. While I'm sympathetic to the intent of the amendment and the uh, increased funding for the National Heritage Areas, I'm concerned that the offset would take funds away from the accounts providing funding 
uh, funds for operations of our national parks across the country. One of our goals in this bill was to provide sufficient funding for park operations so that every park service unit in the country would be open for business next year without the threat of layoffs or furloughs for full-time or seasonal employees. My fear is that reducing this account by $8.8 .8 million would undermine the operations of our national parks. Let me also point out that while the amount in the bill is reduced from fiscal year 2011 enacted level, the national heritage areas are funded in the bill at the amount requested by the President's budget. You know, these things are, these national heritage areas are supposed to become self-sufficient. And the problem is, is we're going to see that when that doesn't happen, the funding request from the President is going to uh, not be in their budget and consequently there's not going to be any money for these national heritage areas requested by the administration. We funded this at the President's level. I appreciate what the, what the gentlemen are trying to do. Uh, I support the national heritage areas program, but I, because of the offset, reluctantly oppose this amendment. The gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentlelady from the District of Columbia rise? You're not on this amendment yet. No. You've got to finish this amendment. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman uh, from New York. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed chair. to. Mr. Chair. For I, what purpose does the I, gentleman rise? I call for a recorded vote, a recorded, please. A recorded vote has been requested pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18. Further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York will be postponed. The gentleman, for what purposes, the gentleman rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Amash of Michigan. Gentlemen, uh, may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you know the federal government subsidizes the Goo Goo Dolls, Leonard Skinner, and the Gypsy Kings? What about the Culture Shock East Coast Dance Concert? Well, it does. My amendment to H.R. 2584 will reduce the deficit, save taxpayer dollars, and stop subsidies to bands, including the Beach Boys. This amendment will reduce the deficit by $2.2 million by transferring funding from the National Capital Area Performing Arts Program to the Spending Reduction Account. The National Capital Area Performing Arts Program provides free concerts and subsidized performances in and around Washington, D.C. by paying for ushers, performers, lighting, and other performance-related costs. The program funds venues like Carter Barron Amphitheater in D.C. Even the National Park Service, which administers the program, has recommended its elimination, saying it distracts the Park Service from performing its core functions. My amendment is simple. It will transfer all of the program's $2.2 million in funding to the spending reduction account. I like the Beach Boys as much as the next person. But that doesn't mean we should force taxpayers to subsidize my ticket if I go to their concert. Don't break taxpayers' trust. I urge my colleagues to support this common sense amendment to prevent the wasteful spending of taxpayer dollars on niche entertainment programs in the Washington, D.C. area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Well, I rise to claim opposition to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. First of all, I, I'm not sure why we want the Beach Boys to be the issue here. I, we were just discussing uh, Mr. Watt's tenure as Secretary of the Interior. I, uh, that was not so successful when he came after the Beach Boys, but uh, be that as it may, uh, what we're really talking about here are a number of nonprofit organizations. Uh, they, um, and these are national memorials, Ford's Theater, Wolf Trap, I guess because the Beach Boys performed a Wolf Trap, they are an issue. Actually, I would recommend to the gentleman that uh, he watch them perform. They, I guess it's more my age than yours that can relate to them, but it was a pretty good performance. But not, I digress. Uh, we're talking about Ford's Theater, Wolf Trap, Carter Barron, all part of the National Park System. The Kennedy Center is a national memorial. These are performing arts right here on the Capitol grounds as well. Now, we're talking about nationally significant sites, and the performances that occur, in fact, are part of the mission 
of these sites. They were authorized for uh, uh, the members of the public, the taxpaying public, to come to a nonprofit uh, venue and, in fact, be entertained. They, uh, the, the national parks do that. They entertain the public that pays for them. Sometimes it's by seeing iconic sites. Sometimes it's by hiking and camping. Sometimes it's by performances. So the National Park Service is in keeping with its mission to interpret the purpose of these national sites. These performances are seen by citizens, in fact, all over the country. Many people who visit our nation's capital attend these performances as part of their trip to the District of Columbia. And the crowds that fill the west lawn of the Capitol on Memorial Day and the 4th of July are testament to the public support for this program. In fact, if you were there on Memorial Day or the 4th of July and turned to see the crowd, there are people as far as the eye can see, people representative of this vast, diverse country, and every single one of them had a smile on their face. Every single one of them uh, were delighted, overjoyed, uh, that they were able to uh, participate and appreciate and enjoy uh, the performance that was put on on the 4th of July and Memorial Day. That's part of our nation's heritage. It's a proud part. This amendment would do real harm to programs enjoyed by millions of Americans. I would also suggest that this line item has already suffered a, a, a virtually devastating cut. Uh, the, uh, it, it was funded at um, about $10 million. It's been cut to about $2 million. I mean, it's just barely hanging on. And now this amendment would eliminate it? I mean, think about this. And think about this. And uh, I, I know that some of the members and at least as many members of the, minorities, uh, of the majority side as the minority side were there in the for the Memorial Day concert. I saw them. I was sitting with them. The chairman of the full appropriations committee, the chairman of the subcommittees, uh, the, uh, the leadership of the House and Senate were all there honoring our troops. Well, I'd be happy to yield, but you, uh, you may want to take your own time, but go I do, ahead. But, but, but be happy Colin to Powell was there to, congr to thank all of the troops that had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and many of the wounded warriors were there as well. Well, not only were that, but Team Six that had just uh, uh, dealt with Osama bin Laden in a fairly definitive manner, the, the Team Seal Six was there. Now, we couldn't identify them, but we all applauded for them, and they couldn't have been more overjoyed, and the gentleman makes a very good point, uh, Colin Powell was basically the master of ceremonies. Now, this is what we want to eliminate? This is what is such a threat to our budget that's taking so much money? It's not taking that much money, and, it's, uh, and whatever money it's taking, it's giving back far more in return. Thank you for yielding, and I hope that we can defeat this unneeded amendment. Gentlemen, uh, I'll yield, yield back. back. The Gentlemen, yield back. back. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentleman from Idaho rise? Mood strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment, uh, and I agree with uh, the words that were spoke by the gentleman for, from Virginia and from Washington. Uh, you know, in these tough economic times, it is, uh, it is important that we keep some things that are very important, I think, to the American people. And if you look at the programs that have been put on by the Capitol concerts on the 4th of July and on Memorial Day, and what they've done for our troops and for really the spirit of America, I think is vitally important. And they do things at Ford's Theater and other places around this country. And we have to remember, this is our nation's capital. The things they do here are important. They're important for our country, not just for this small piece of land we call Washington, D.C. So I hope that members on both sides of the aisle would recognize the importance of these programs and the work they do and the importance that they have for the American people 
and would reject this amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman, did the gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and, and the amendment is not agreed to. I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote having been requested pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan will be postponed. We'll read, proceed with the reading. Page 14, line 14, National Recreation and Preservation, $49,363,000. For what purpose does the gentlelady from the District of Columbia rise? I have an amendment uh, at the desk and waive the reading. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Norton of District of Columbia. Page 14, line 19, after the dollar amount, insert decreased by $300,000, increased by $300,000. Gentlelady may proceed. Mr. Speaker, my amendment would designate $300,000 from the National Recreation and Preservation Account for a National Park Service study of whether applying the same rules and regulations to all parks maximizes the highest and best use of individual parks for the system as a whole and for Americans who use our parks. This is but a study. And it would require the National Park Service to look at how NPS, cities, counties, and states, as well as other countries, manage their diverse parks and to suggest from the available best practices appropriate ways to help NPS meet the needs of individual communities within the basic uniformity necessary to operate a national park, a national system of parks. Today, the NPS applies the same rules and regulations to all its parks, regardless of location, from the, from the almost 1,200 square mile Yosemite National Park to small urban parks on street corners. I support a unified national park system, but NPS should develop flexible standards that take into account the unique circumstances and population of individual parks and changing conditions throughout the country in keeping with congressional recognition of both conservation and recreation as primary reasons for our parks. The neighborhood parks in the District of Columbia, for example, serve a very different function from Yellowstone. Uh, DuPont Circle Park is a central urban community meeting place in the district, not a place for enjoying greener, the greenery of nature as much as we love our parks for that purpose. On any given day, you will find people playing chess, sunbathing, playing fris frisbee, or passing out flyers. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Speaker, I have come to the floor because I have tried unsuccessfully to get uh, the, the Park Service to make small adaptations perfectly compatible with their mission uh, to allow for the people in the parks in my own district. And I am certain that other members have found similar roadblocks. For example, the Park Service won't allow park uh, bike share stations on or near federal parks. Uh, and they are not permitting the three golf courses in the District of Columbia to be run as a public-private partnership. Both of these examples have run into the same one-size-fits-all concession concerns. Yet the National Park Service could negotiate concession agreements that accommodate bike share in the future. And, for, and inflexibility uh, in Park Service insistence on concession contracts that do not allow capital investment resulting in an astonishing deterioration of invaluable capital-intensive golf courses in, in, in the district could give way uh, to other approaches, such as public-private partnerships operating under long-term leases that would allow private funding to assist the Park Service with upgrading and maintaining these public a assets with Congress uh, which the taxpayers can't possibly uh, by themselves main, maintain. Um, 
inflexible, um, one-size-fits-all policies keep Americans from using our parks for compatible purposes, such as bike, sta bike stations, or worse, condemn unique, iconic resources to inevitable decline. Uh, Madam Speaker, my amendment is of the lowest possible cost. It is for a study to tell us what to do, to tell the Park Service what to do, to allow people throughout this country who live in very different locations and need to use our parks in very different ways, just how this must be done, uh, compatible with a uniform National Park Service. And I ask that uh, my amendment uh, be approved. I yield uh, to the well, no, you don't need to yield because I'll strike the... All right, I, I yield back the, the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Uh, Madam Chairman, I, I think we have a problem in the amendment itself because it would uh, specifically designate uh, a, uh, a study that might be interpreted uh, as some type of, uh, of earmark, which it, I don't think it really is. Oh, I, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, the, um, I like what the gentlelady is trying to do. I think it's, uh, it, it's important. Uh, I think we ought to have uh, a, a consideration by the Park Service of uh, whether they are sufficiently uh, flexible in dealing with local communities. There was a recent article written in the Washington Post uh, talking about uh, uh, some of the uh, opportunities that exist to bring the community into local parks, urban parks, uh, where far more people could be involved, uh, people could participate, people could enhance the, uh, uh, the enjoyment of um, the things that take place. For example, there's a large soccer event at a park that's controlled by the National Park Service. You could bring the whole community in to watch it on a large screen. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's no question but that we could find ways to uh, discourage uh, automobiles and encourage bikes. Have bike sharing, for example, on the National Mall uh, so that people could uh, uh, could rent bikes and, and bike around the mall. They, it wouldn't cause any environmental damage. In fact, it would preserve some of the, the lawn on our National Mall. And uh, uh, I think pe uh, some people would enjoy it more and they get a little exercise. Just all kinds of ideas uh, might be proposed by communities. I remember being out in Washington State, San Juan Island, and uh, this was a little place, it's a national park because it's a, 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 a bizarre military conflict that, uh, uh, that occurred out there. I won't go into the whole military conflict, uh, but um, the, uh, the people there love the bunny rabbits that are there. Well, the Park Service decided that they're really not a, uh, a native species, they, there are too many of them, and uh, so the Park Service decided they're going to use the uh, the method they use other places, and first of all, they thought they would gas them, uh, which the community uh, was uh, shocked by. Uh, then, they, uh, then they decided, well, we'll shoot them and so on, reduce the population. You know, if they had just sat down uh, with members of the community, they could have figured out how to keep these bunnies that the community wanted uh, avoid a whole lot of negative attitude with regard to the Park Service and, in, fancy, in fact, in, in, enhance the enjoyment of this little national park at San Juan. I'm sure there are examples all over the country, in fact, all over the world, because the National Park Service has any number of parks outside the, uh, the physical uh, 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 boundaries of our uh, North American continent. We've got the uh, Virgin Islands and so on. I don't know what the local neighborhoods might suggest, but I do know that they have a lot of good ideas, ideas that the National Park Service ought to consider thoughtfully uh, and uh, 
some will be rejected, but some might well ex be accepted. But the process of that kind of community input, it seems to me, would generate even more support for the National Park Service. Uh, it's a great institution. Uh, our parks are iconic assets to our nation. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do think that the local community could enjoy them more and appreciate the National Park Service's role more if uh, we had the kind of dialogue uh, with the Park Service that Ms. Norton is suggesting. I don't see any harm in having that kind of study. Uh, I think we ought to be able to uh, work with the gentlelady, maybe uh, put together some report language, at least a letter to the, uh, uh, the head of the National Park Service suggesting uh, that uh, this is an area that the Congress itself, uh, in a bipartisan way, thinks we uh, that ought to be explored. So. Uh, uh, if the gentleman would like me to yield to him, unless he'd like to claim his own time. I'm going to yield. I, yeah. 